So 2006, I think you are appointed director general of OCP. Mm -hmm. Two years later, you become the chief executive of the company. Mm -hmm. What, um, how did this come about? What was your, what were you asked to do? Why did they appoint you and what was your assignment? Well, I was appointed because the government was questioning OCP's situation. At, at that point, OCP was a, a loss-making company. In fact, it wasn't a company. It was a parastatal. So the O used to stand for office, but had been in a difficult situation financially for the, the previous years. And that wasn't in kilter with the size of uh, phosphate reserves in Morocco. Uh, so there was a question on why, why was that the situation. Uh, and um, knowing that, uh, that I was a bit on the, you know, a man of challenges or maybe a bit crazy uh, uh, on accepting challenges, they asked me to look at the situation and say whether I was willing to try to resolve the problem. And that's what, that's a challenge they knew I couldn't refuse. <laughs> so what was wrong with the company? So, so Morocco is sitting, I understand, some ridiculously high percentage of the world's phosphate, so 70% or something. How could it manage to be a loss-making entity? Well, that's obviously the first question we, we ask ourselves. Uh, the answer was a combination of things, but mainly the fact that the company had stayed predominantly in the mining business mm. and, and was selling uh, the ore, the phosphate, uh, what we call phosphate rock, basically to um, uh, its, its core business was f selling phosphate rock uh, and, in, and, and was certainly not... Uh, profitable in that the price of phosphate had remained very stable, even in nominal dollars, for 30 years. Mm. Uh, and as you can imagine, the costs were not stable. So in, in real dollars, you know, we were in a business where, where uh, our, our main product was, uh, in, the, in real terms, uh, going down in terms of price, in real dollar terms. Uh, so that's what created the, uh, you know, the costs uh, keeping, uh, you know, moving higher. That's what created the losses, yearly losses in the company. Uh, so we, we initially also looked at uh, whether mismanagement or not. We, we even, um, my first move was to ask Kroll, you remember the company who audited Enron, to look, uh, to look at the, to do some for forensic work, and, and and there was no absolutely no mismanagement. Their report was no. You have a lack of strategy. This is a company that doesn't have a clear strategy, but there is uh, absolutely no mismanagement. So we we said then what we have to fix is the strategy, and the strategy was very common sense. Was to say we, we have to move to the finished product, we have to move down the value chain, uh, and become. And, and move in the business of our clients, which is fertilizer, which is plant nutrition. So we decided that the, the, the only way out was to add value in the country to the, to the phosphate rock and produce various things that are uh, finished products out of that uh, phosphate uh, rock. And the rest is history. We were able to invest massively in fertilizer production uh, and, and, and and get the company out of the, its situation um, rather quickly. I believe OCP has uh, been making donations to African countries as, as well as fertilizers. Can you can you say some words about that? Again, you have to put this in the backdrop of uh, what we have done over the past. Uh, eight to 10 years in Africa, which is customize the fertilizer, mm -hmm. <laughs> working locally to for, formulate also the right type of fertilizer. And, and not just the, the right type, but the, the right practices, uh, not applying all the nutrients at the same time and so on and so forth. Then, you know, if you recall, uh, uh, this is uh, almost a year, a, a bit past a year since the Ukraine war started. 
And at that point, the in the, in the early March, April last year, <clears throat> there was a panic, almost a panic movement on fertilizer because some of the fertilizer was coming from Russia uh, to Africa uh, mainly, and, but also to Europe. And even with the natural gas worries in Europe, you know, the, the nitrogen-based fertilizer companies were very worried not to get the feedstock, the, the, the gas. And I, I believe even a few fertilizer factories st closed, stopped production. So there was a very, uh, this could have been a catastrophe for some of the African countries that were importing fertilizer. So at that stage, the, also the nitrogen prices were going through the roof because of the gas prices, if you recall. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the, for, we reach way the, you know, beyond the affordability point for African, some African farmers, the small uh, farm holders, the, 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 the farmers, the individual African farmers were uh, uh, almost... Uh, you know, could not afford fertilizer. So what we did is a program of donation uh, targeted to the sm small uh, holder in, a, in various African countries. So I, I forgot how many, but probably a good 20 countries. We've done uh, targeted donations to fertilizer, and usually the customized fertilizer, by the way, to the sm small uh, holder farm. But this was part of a bigger program, uh, you know, the donation part, which is uh, uh, committing to to serve the whole African demand uh, if we had to. So at that, you know, last year or years before, we represented about 50% of market share in, in Africa. Keep in mind, we're the first African producer uh, of fertilizer. Many other African countries have phosphate, but haven't invested in fertilizer production. They export that phosphate to other producers in, uh, in the rest of the world. So uh, we had about 50% market share in Africa. Uh, but since the pa there was this uh, genuine worry about where fertilizer would come to Africa, we decided to... Uh, commit uh, that we could serve the whole African market if we had to. And that was a, a big, much b bigger program, 4 million tons of fertilizer that are dedicated to Africa, whereas usually we dedicate only 1 or 2 million tons. This was a big uh, uh, allocation of fertilizer to Africa and worked with the World Bank and the USAID and other institutions to make sure that those fertilizers were channeled where they should go, particularly that the donations were channeled to the small holder. Usually we associate the use of fertilizer as a necessary evil, because fertilizer account for about 50% of world food production. Let's not forget this. So, as much as we'd like to go organic uh, tomorrow, uh, it would, it, we would have to accept not to feed half the population. Mm -hmm. But usually because of this overuse of, uh, of, of nutrients in specific places and at specific times, uh, fertilizer are associated with environmental de degradation. It doesn't have to be again. If we go through the customization process, monitoring in real time the nutrient content of the soil and the plant and only feeding the soil and the plant the right amount of nutrient at the right time, this should be uh, completely uh, avoid all, all the negative impact. But the most important part is the one that is, has been completely unexplored, is that by using also, by reinforcing soil health through the right nutrition of soil, we increase its carbon sequestration capabilities. By so, some people think, some experts think by massive amounts. Okay, but even the, those who are the most, uh, I would say, conservative, we're talking about 
potentially the capacity to sequester about 10% of, this is the most conservative. Some say even twice the amount of carbon that we emit every year can be sequestered in the soil. So it could become a big solution. But even if we go conservative, say 10, 20%, it's a massive uh, contribution to reduction of green, of even absorption of what has been emitted. That is clearly the case in, in some of the experiments we're doing. It's clearly uh, the case for customized fertilizer and, and, custom, and, and the right practices along with applying fertilizer. And it could be a, a way to bring in kilter to SDGs, the, 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 the hunger, the reducing hunger and the climate problem. They usually thought of, let's find a trade-off. We may not have to. What is the environmental impact of your company if you look at the whole process? So, you know, if we discuss this in terms of the usual vocabulary, so you have the scope one, two, and three emissions. Uh, so obviously, as an industrial company, we have uh, emissions related to scope one and two. So that's, as any industrial company uh, and logistical company, uh, uh, they are greenhouse, uh, you know, they are C CO2 um, uh, uh, emissions from our industrial facilities, for example. Uh, as a company, we've committed to be uh, net uh, carbon neutral in scope one and two. So those scopes that are directly related to op operations and the type of energy we're using to be carbon neutral before 2030. So we are now investing massively into renewable energy as a substitute to the other types of energy we're using and decarbonizing, decarbonizing our supply chain, uh, our internal supply chain in uh, at the company to handle scope one and two. Uh, we have huge opportunities to do that because of the solar and wind uh, capabilities in Morocco. It's tremendous uh, efficiency in solar energy production. The country has spearheaded that movement in Africa years ago by installing one of the largest and the first solar energy plant uh, already maybe eight years ago. So, to, so we, we, we've been uh, pioneers in, in solar for, for many years. Uh, and now we're taking advantage of what lessons learned, at least at OCP, to deploy massively solar energy. You know, we're thinking of up to five gigawatts, which mm -hmm. is, to put it in perspective, half the production, the current production of Morocco would be solar the energy that we will solar and wind that we would produce for our own needs and, and to substitute completely the, 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 the fossil fuel-based uh, uh, sources that, uh, that we use. That, that takes care of scope one and two. Scope three is usually the more complicated because it's the one that relates to what is done with our products. And this is where what I mentioned before is very is, a, is an amazing opportunity is that is, is is reversing precisely through the right use of fertilizer and the 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 type of fertilizer used to make the farmer a carbon banker so to speak the farmer will contribute positively to slow down even potentially reverse climate change uh, so our commitment is also on scope three to be uh, carbon neutral before 2040. And that's that's going to take also making fertilizers that are then at least the nitrogen part. You know, the phosphate part is mineral. It's not a chemical. But the nitrogen part, we're, that investment in renewable energy will allow us to produce uh, uh, gr green hydrogen and then green nitrogen, ammonia or green urea, uh, that would have been produced with the renewable energy. 
and as a substitute to the to the nitrogen fertilizers that today we buy uh, as a, as a company because Morocco has no uh, no natural gas reserves uh, yet uh, to, to to speak of. Can you explain, first of all, what was the need for a, yeah. another university in Morocco? Yeah, no. Uh, uh, recall, you know, we started saying, you know, the the, the human capital uh, challenge, uh, massive uh, uh, amount of people going on retirement because they mm. they were getting that uh, to 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 the age of retirement, hiring a massive amount of uh, younger people so average age in 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 the in two years at ocp went from 47 and i'm talking about 20,000 colleagues 47 to 35 okay so it's just by that phenomenon of older people leaving and younger people coming and as i mentioned previously uh, executive education, technical, continuous education, technical training, uh, you know, to complement what these, you know, these are younger people who had gone through top universities and top engineering schools, but not necessarily, for example, engineers that needed to acquire managerial skills. So we did, for example, executive education many weeks and programs with I should say in France or with Sloan Business School uh, here across the river. Uh, very in, at one point we said, no, we, we, we're going to need an, a, a corporate university. This should, all should be consolidated mm. in, a uni in our in-house university. Okay? Uh, so we decided to go about uh, you know, customizing our own programs uh, doing things that are more adapted to our needs um, in something that became a corporate university. At the same time, we, uh, we embarked into massive research and development to, uh, to help in our transformation uh, and transition to, again, sectors that we did not operate in, agriculture, uh, plant nutrition, uh, renewable energy, so our, our needs and our programs in research development and innovation were, were, were massive, and we were working with outside universities to do that. We felt this, the need to bring those in-house at the same corporate university. And we, we planned to do that. The, the size of the university, this corporate university, became such that at one point, I uh, uh, I presented it to 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 the king, to his Majesty, and uh, and he had this very provocative comment. He said, "This is very selfish. It, this is such an important thing that you're doing just for OCP. It's a full, you know, you should make it think of making it a full fledged university." And that's and he was right, because. Um, you know, there was room to make it a full-fledged university. Uh, he he gave it his name. He said it should be called Mohammed the Sixth because I want to make sure you don't you you don't privatize it for your own purposes after that. But but uh, what was right is that uh, we had all the ingredients to make a full-fledged university, and that's what it became. Of course. A lot of the research agenda of the university is OCPs, but now it's doing research for contributing research and innovation for the whole of, actually, not just Morocco, but the African continent. Uh, it has an African business school, what you call the ABS. It has a, a business school uh, uh, and many the other components uh, of what a full-fledged university is. And it, 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 it's also useful for us continuously in terms of the continuous and executive training and technical training that we do continuously at OCP because you know we have this learning um, we, we we have what what we call 
not, not values, I would say, but more, um, uh, how should I say it, beliefs. We have two core beliefs, and one of them is, we call it nefs. Nefs is, is, uh, is, is, is basically having a growth mindset. So it should translate into a growth mindset. Uh, in never being content with what you see and what you, you've achieved, but seeking always further improvement and growth. Being constantly challenging yourself to higher growth. And if you think about it, that's creating an appetite for learning. So having an in-house capability to continuously learn, experiment, uh, is key to, to being honest vis-a-vis -vis that um, core beliefs of the company. Is we, we tell our, our colleagues, uh, you know, the, the growth mindset is key, it is, you know, is key to our to achieving our greater purpose in the company. And if you're convinced of that, then uh, we, you should be convinced that we need all to learn and grow in the company. And, and we have an in-house capability to do this. What is the environmental impact of your company if you look at the whole process? So, you know, if we discuss this in terms of the usual vocabulary, so you have the scope one, two, and three emissions. Uh, so obviously, as an industrial company, we have uh, emissions related to scope one and two. So that's, as any industrial company uh, and logistical company, uh, uh, there are greenhouse, uh, you know, there are C CO2 um, uh, uh, emissions from our industrial facilities, for example. Uh, as a company, we've committed to be uh, net uh, carbon neutral in scope one and two. So those scopes that are directly related to op operations and the type of energy we're using to be carbon neutral before 2030. So we are now investing massively into renewable energy as a substitute to the other types of energy we're using and decarbonizing, decarbonizing our supply chain, uh, our internal supply chain in uh, at the company to handle scope one and two. Uh, we have huge opportunities to do that because of the solar and wind uh, capabilities in Morocco. It's tremendous uh, efficiency in solar energy production. The country has spearheaded that movement in Africa years ago by installing one of the largest and the first solar energy plant uh, already maybe eight years ago. So, to, so we, we, we've been uh, pioneers in, in solar for, for many years. Uh, and now we're taking advantage of what lessons learned, at least at OCP, to deploy massively solar energy. You know, we're thinking of up to five gigawatts, which mm -hmm. is, to put it in perspective, half the production, the current production of Morocco would be solar the energy that we will solar and wind that we would produce for our own needs and, and to substitute completely the, 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 the fossil fuel-based uh, uh, sources that, uh, that we use. That, that takes care of scope one and two. Scope three is usually the more complicated because it's the one that relates to what is done with our products. And this is where what I mentioned before is very is, a, is an amazing opportunity is that is, is is reversing precisely through the right use of fertilizer and the 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 type of fertilizer used to make the farmer a carbon banker so to speak the farmer will contribute positively to slow down even potentially reverse climate change uh, so our commitment is also on scope three to be uh, carbon neutral before 2040. And that's, that's going to take also making fertilizers that are 
the, at least the nitrogen part, you know, the phosphate part is mineral. It's not a chemical. But the nitrogen part, we're, that investment in renewable energy will allow us to produce uh, uh, gr green hydrogen and then green nitrogen, ammonia or green urea, uh, that would have been produced be with the renewable energy. And as a substitute to the to the nitrogen fertilizers that today we buy uh, as a, as a company because Morocco has no uh, no natural gas reserves uh, yet uh, to, to to speak of. 